Novak for hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for hire. That's what the sign outside my office says. Pat Novak for hire. Or you can set it to music or put it up in neon. But down here on the waterfront in San Francisco, you're too busy staying alive to worry about the next guy unless he's pointing a gun. Most of the time, you got as much chance as a flypapered fly on his solo flight. But it works out. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else to keep my stomach and my conscience running even. It's like juggling hot marbles on a high wire. But it's a living, and you haven't any more kick coming than a swimmer diving into an empty pool. I found that out last Tuesday night. I was sitting in my office after dinner, watching the fog stream through the gate and wrap up the bay for the night. Up on Russian Hill, the lights were just going on in the thousand-dollar-a-month apartments, and right away you got a picture of warm rooms and cold martinis. I guess I was feeling sorry for myself, so I started to page through an old address book full of bad debts and tired memories. I was getting older by the page, and the regrets were piling up around my knees when the phone rang. Novak talking. This is Father Leahy, Patsy. Are you busy? Yeah, Father. Tearing up old phone numbers. Are you reforming or angry? Neither one, Father. They just wore out. You sound sad, Patsy. Expect them to last forever? Nothing's that good. What's on your mind? I want to ask you a favor. Make it a small one, Father. I'm all out of big ones. It's a small one, Patsy, for you. Yeah, another customer told me the same thing, Father. His brother was on the way to the chair. He wanted me to smuggle in some rubber underwear. I'm asking, Patsy, not begging. Okay, Father, what do you need? Can you see me in about an hour, right after the evening rosary? When's it over? Oh, about uh, 8.30. But don't be afraid of coming early. No, I'll take a rain check on that, Father. That's what Noah's friends used to say. I'll see you at 8.30. It was a little before 8.30 when I started up the steps of Father Leahy's parish church. I figured the services were over, so I hung around in the vestibule for a couple of minutes, trying to look like a part-time bell ringer. The last few people straggled out, and then an altar boy came out and gave me the high sign. He was a clean, Irish-looking little kid with a face the size of a minute and just about as young. Are you Mr. Novak, sir? Yeah, that's right. You the lookout? I'm an older boy, Mr. Novak. My name's Jake Siegel. Little Jake father calls me. Yeah. Well, where's Father Leahy now, Jake? He's back in the sacristy, Mr. Novak. He wants you to wait inside here. No, this'll do. I'll wait right here. No, sir, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry. Father says to be sure and bring you inside. Okay, little Jake, lead the way. This way, Mr. Novak, down the side. I guess I was too busy trying to act like I knew my way around to pay much attention to a fat, chunky little guy when he stood up in the back pew a couple of aisles over. Little Jake seemed to peg trouble in the air. Mr. Novak, that man back there... What's he doing? All right, Quinlan, here's your payoff. Turn around and take it. Jake, get down. Mr. Novak, look out, look out! Down on the waterfront, you'll learn early to look for trouble any place, any time. You can find it at the top of the mark or at the bottom of the bay. But this is the first time it caught up with me in the middle of a church. The lead got as thick as confetti on New Year's Eve. I spun around and I made a dive for little Jake, but I wasn't soon enough. He went down like young wheat in a hailstorm. When I grabbed for him, I must have hit my head in the base of a marble pillar or something, and things got dark for a minute. I stumbled down the aisle and into the street after the guy, but the odds were all on his side. The fog was so thick you couldn't read a newspaper with a Klieg light. 
I guess I covered every alley and street in the neighborhood, but it was like running after a hat full of feathers in the middle of a windstorm. Oh, I don't know how much later it was when I stopped for a minute in an empty doorway and I tried to remember what I was chasing. A siren was crying somewhere in the distance, so I started back for the church. The coroner's wagon was just pulling away when I got there, and Father Leahy had disappeared. I saw a light in the rectory, so I went upstairs and rang the bell. He came to the door in his shirt sleeves. He just stood there for a minute looking at me. Then he motioned me inside. You want to see me, Father? Yes. In here. Sit down. The kid, Father. Little Jake. What do you think? Yeah. They go fast? Instantly. I'll get the guy, Father. I'm not asking that, Patsy. I'm not asking you for anything anymore. Unless I need trouble. No, somebody told you a bad story, Father. That wasn't my gun. I should have known better than to call you. I should have known it meant trouble. It's your middle name, Patsy. You're married to it. You're looking at the wrong man. It wasn't my party. I called you here tonight to ask you a favor, Patsy. Anything you want, Father. It's too late now. We were going to have an altar boys picnic tomorrow over at Paradise Cove. I wanted to borrow one of your boats. We won't be going now, Patsy. We've got a funeral instead. Yeah. What do you want me to say? Don't say anything, Patsy. Just listen for a minute. I asked you to come up here tonight, but I didn't tell you to bring your friends. If you've got any private fights with those waterfront hoods, that's your business. But don't bring your beefs into the church. And I tell you, I never saw the guy before. I don't know anything about it. He was shooting at you when he hit little Jake, wasn't he? What else am I supposed to think? Yeah. They find the murder gun? Nothing. Your playmates are neat, Patsy. I liked you better without the temper, Father. And I liked you better before your hands got dirty, Patsy. I warned you about that waterfront crowd, the cheap thugs, the cheap women. I told you, Patsy, roll around in dirt long enough and some of it's bound to stick to you. You've got it all over your face and your hands and it's working inside you, Patsy. It's working in deep. At the end of the sermon, Father? I tried to warn you, but you had it figured. Well, figure this one, Patsy. There's a nine-year-old kid on his way to the morgue. He stepped in front of a bullet and saved your life. Now go ahead. Figure it. Yeah, I will, Father. But you better be on call when I catch up with the guy. He's going to have a lot of praying to do. When I left Father Leahy, I checked in at the church for one more look around. A couple of red-faced Irish cops in uniform were wandering around the vestibule, trying to look at home and chewing gum like mad to kill the beer on their breath. And over in one corner, half a dozen old women had their heads together, clucking like hens over a square egg. Outside of them, the place was deserted. I gave the course a quick rundown. A couple of aisles over, where I figured the gunsel must have passed, I picked up a matchbook. The ad on the front said, Max Joint, Cicero, Illinois. And there was a phone number scrawled inside the cover. I was just about ready to toss it away when a bell rang, and I took a closer look. It was my phone number. I put the matchbook in my pocket, and I started home for the apartment. Maybe the cab wasn't going fast enough because halfway there, three years' stock of headache caught up with me and the ceiling started to jump. Oh, the cab driver was kind, though. When we got to my place, he offered to help me as far as the curb for an extra four bits. By the time I made it to my front door, I was feeling lower than end man at an Irish wake. The reception committee didn't help much. They were short and dark, all three of them, with rolls of loose, oily fat where their necks should have been and... Small pig eyes that squinted through the cigar smoke, rolling out of wide nostrils and up their faces. Hi, Ann Novak. How do you feel? Lots better after you find the door. Hey, Dex. Novak don't like us. He'll cultivate a taste. No, they don't build stomachs that strong. <laughs> Be nice. It's easier that way. Now look, Buster, I don't know who you three pigs are, but I want <laughs> Novak. Remember, be nice. Yeah, I'll remember. You West Coast punks are all alike, Novak. Couple of taps and you cry. Ain't that right, lad? Maybe Novak's tired, fellas. Help him into a chair. Yeah, Novak. Sit down. Lud wants to say something. All right, then say it and get out of here. We want the gun, Novak. We want the papers that go with it. Sounds like a great puzzle. Sorry, I can't help with the answer. You better tell Lud, Novak. It's liable to get rough. All right. My gun's over there on the desk and the paper's on the wall. 
<laughs> Be nice, Novak. Just once more, Novak. Where's the gun and where's the papers? Look, I'll spell it for you. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Dex, Mac, get his arm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, hold his head up. Yeah. Okay, lad, there. This the way they do it in Cicero? <laughs> Last time round, Novak, the gun and the papers, where are they? I don't know. <laughs> the gun, Novak. The papers. No use, boss. We lost him. All right. It's a big floor. Let him find his own way back. Well, it was a long night for summer. When I woke up, the sun was bleeding through a rip in the blinds and there was a funny smell in the room. My stomach felt like a piece of practice rope at a Boy Scout class. And then the room got noisy. You wake up slow, Novak. Have a hard night. Oh, you're never on time for the party, are you, Hellman? I'm choosy, Novak. I don't like your friends. All right, then take up social work. What's the occasion? I've got a phone tip. When I drop up for a visit. You're having fun? Yeah. There's a gal in the kitchen bored to death. Huh? Take a look. Uh, she took it hard. Who is she? Sally Kimbrough. That's what her driver's license says. Is she a friend of yours? How would I know? Even her mother couldn't tell. Messed up, isn't she, Novak? Must have been a rough party. I wouldn't know, Hellman. I closed early. At your joint, what happened? I said I closed early. Three Gunsels were drinking my scotch when I got home about 10.30. They were anxious about a gun and some papers, and they figured I could put them straight. I couldn't, so they laid me out. Now tell me how sorry you are. I bleed for you, Novak. Now let's have it straight. That's as straight as you're going to get it, Hellman. If it's not exciting enough, try Esquire. You talk brave for a punk in hot water. I'm not going to scream till it burns. Then you better start practicing, Novak, because I'm going to burn you. You better hurry, Hellman. Your pension's catching up with you. Watch your mouth, Novak. You're not talking to your gunsel friends. Well, that's hard to tell, Hellman. You both use the same technique. Now show me the warrant before I start charging your rent. That dame's body is all the warrant I need, Novak. Now talk. How did she get so dead? I told you once. Pick up the three gunsels and ask them. What they look like? Like you. The size smaller. They're from the east around Chicago. What else? They wouldn't leave their birth certificate. Go ahead, smart boy. Get in all the laughs you can. But don't ask me to con the parole board for you. Oh, I don't know, Hellman. You won't be there. Maybe I'll like prison life. <laughs> When you're knee-deep in the rain and your boots spring a leak, you might as well throw them away and take your chances barefoot. Hellman and his boys left with the body, and I grabbed a handful of aspirin and a cold shower. Then I started out to look for the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A pretty smart man until he found out you can poison your worries at $4 a fifth. I finally found him sitting in the middle of a bourbon fog in a little Spanish joint somewhere on the edge of the Excelsior District. <laughs> He was down at the end of the bar, trying his best to make time with a plaster bust of Queen Isabella. Ah, Pepsi, you're just in time for a short one. Bartender, hand me that page. Come on, Jocko, sober up. I gotta talk to you. Patsy, here's to your own peculiar brand of happiness. Jocko, will you cut it out? Patsy, I don't mean to be rude or ungentlemanly, but I don't think I altogether approve of the clientele in this place. Yeah, yeah. Shh, this woman next to me, Patsy, the one with the stony gaze... She's been here ever since I came in. And I i don't mean to be uncharitable, but I think she's the picture of a perfect boy. All right, all right. Patsy, to a member of the old Castilian school, there can be no excuse for the conduct she's exhibited. Why, do you know I was even good enough to buy her three rounds of Portuguese brandy? Imported, mind you. But what do I get for my pains? Not even a civil thank you. All right, Jocko. I've been sitting here in the most gentlemanly way, sipping this delicate nectar in great mouthfuls and trying to keep the party going. But does she help? No. I've talked to her about politics, medicine, literature, Keats, Byron, Shelley, Nick Kenny. I've even talked about the weather. Jocko, she's a statue. She's a... Oh, a simple oversight, Patsy. Might happen to anyone. Listen a minute, will you? I'm in trouble. You're always in trouble, Patsy. And that's the way you'll stay till you find some kind of moral rudder. You've got to find direction instead of trying to be so righteous in an evil sort of way. Get in tune with our decaying civilization. Like me, Patsy. Why tempt the fates... It's much more practical to buy off your destiny with a good fifth of Irish whiskey. You all through, Jocko? Yes. Uh, what kind of trouble this time? Three gunsels from the east. They're shooting up the town, and I'm running 
front for their murder raps. Patsy, why not plead guilty? The rest might do you good. Somebody shot a nine-year-old kid, an altar boy. Oh. Where did that happen? In Father Leahy's church. The gunsel took me for somebody else and started shooting. Problem's getting bigger, Patsy. What am I supposed to do? I want you to check on a guy by the name of Mike Quinlan. Also a girl, Sally Kimbrough. Tagged by the Examiner and the Chronicle Morgues and knows around the horse parlors out on Eddy Street, will you? Find out everything you can. Well, all right, Patsy, but you've broken up a beautiful party. You've disillusioned me about Queen Isabella here, and I've suddenly grown dreadfully thirsty again. Let's have four or five for the road, shall we? Later, Jocko. We haven't got time. Well, only if you say so, Patsy. But every time I leave the hallowed confines of a bar room, I'm a poor pilgrim caught up in the vices of the crass everyday world. A tattered orphan leaning disconsolately against the bitter winds of chance, tossed and buffeted about endlessly by the cruel storms of fortune. By the way, I'll need car fare. All right, here, half a buck. But, Patsy, refreshment. Later. Now, get going, will you, Jocko? Where can I find you? I'm going to check by my office, then I'm going to see Father Leahy. Well, as soon as he mentions taking the pledge, that's your cue to leave. Good night, lover. <laughs> When I left Jocko, I caught a cab downtown, and on the way, I started hunting for just a piece of the answer. But all I got was questions. Who were the three Gunsels, and what was the stuff they were after? Mike Quinlan, where did he fit in? And that dead girl in my apartment, who did she belong to? Well, the zeros were piling up faster than flies on donuts when the cab pulled up for a stop sign at 16th and Mission, and a little guy with a worried mouth and a loud sports shirt jumped in. His lips were wound around a phony kind of smile like a head waiter just before he hands you the check for a big party. <laughs> hey, it's okay, driver. We're friends. How are you, Patsy? Friendship comes easy for you, mister. You got a name? This is for keeps, Novak. I want to talk. You got until the next corner. We both mean it, Novak. Me and the gun. Now look, Junior, if you want to play the heavy, go find a melodrama. Who are you working for? Sandell? That's as good a name as any. All right, here's your corner. Sally Kimbrough. Where is she, Novak? You're fast with a question, mister. Let me ask you one. Who's Sandell? I got the gun, Novak. Yeah, well, who's Sandell? I'll do the asking. You sit there, make the answers. Oh, you're running out of tickets, Junior. Come here. Hello. All right, now reach down for that gun and I'll jam you through the floorboards. Who's Sandell? It's a Chicago hood. He's out to get me. It works both ways. That's a good plot. Now, who are you? Mike Quinlan. All right, now what about Sally Kimbrough? They mopped her up off my kitchen floor this morning. Somebody's gonna get Sandell. Maybe we're on the same train. What's he look like? Fat men all look alike. All right, you can leave any time now. Sure, Novak. Affairs getting higher. See you later. faster than a Mexican divorce. The black sedan pounded by on all 12 and Quinlan folded up like a playpen in a high wind. We tried to follow the car, but it would have been easier to win the Kentucky Derby on a pogo stick. So I went back to the corner where Quinlan was still hugging the cement. He was draped over the curb like a tired carpet, and if his suit was a brighter yellow, he could have passed for a loading zone. Hellman was there with all his relatives in uniform, so I told the cabbie to drive on. I just couldn't seem to shake the picture of little Jake when he went quiet in that church. Well, when I got close to a phone, I paid off the cabbie and I put in a call to Jocko. I called Newton at the examiner morgue and he said that Jocko had just left, so I called Breen's. I asked for the guy who was drinking the cheapest whiskey in the tallest glass. Jocko Madigan speaking. This is Novak. How'd you make out? Let me tell you about these pack of newspaper men down here. Men of high birth, Patsy. True breeding. They like scotch almost as much as I do. What'd you find out about Quinlan? My Eddie Street informants tagged him as an ex-con, Patsy. Sent up for armed robbery in 1940 and paroled about two weeks ago from Joliet. Quinlan had a few dealings with a man named Lud Sandell. From what I can gather, Quinlan's supposed to have taken the rap for Sandell and his brother. What else? Quinlan's a local boy out of Bernal Heights. He has a sister, Patsy. She belongs to Sandell. She's probably the only sales girl in town with a six-room apartment in the best part of the marina. Did you get the address? Oh, the Bayview Towers, down at the foot of Fillmore Street. Sounds good. Maybe she has a friend. Did you get anything else on Sandell? 
The Third Street set tells me he's out here to set up a slot machine route. I gather he's the pushy type. Thanks, Jocko. I'll see you at the apartment. Oh, Patsy, on your way home, pick up something for dinner at the delicatessen, will you? There's stuff in the icebox. Fix yourself a sandwich. Patsy, dinner without bourbon is life without hope. I'll uh, borrow from the neighbors. Good night, lover. <laughs> When I hung up, I caught a D-car out on Van Ness Avenue and I headed down into the marina. The answer box was still fat with questions and little Jake's killer held a four-lap lead, but at least the field was getting thin. I figured it was one out of three. Sandell or either one of his gunsels, but which one? But when I got down to the foot of Fillmore Street, the fog was thicker than ankles at a fat lady's convention and the foghorns out beyond Yacht Harbor started on overtime. The Bayview Towers was one of those swanky, new-looking places that gets old in a hurry. It saw lots of brass and brunettes during the war, but now the only uniform left belonged to the doorman. I found Quinlan's sister in the penthouse apartment. And when she opened the door, you felt like Clyde Beatty with a broken chair. Her lounging pajamas reminded you of a good butler. They came in and went out at the right places, and they stayed close to the job. I felt like the Fisk boy after somebody blew out his candle. Ah, talent on the loose. Won't you come in? Yeah, it'll save time. My name's Novak. I got some news for you. I'm Bobby Quinlan. Don't go so fast. I'm looking for answers, lady. If you want a companion, advertise. Your brother's dead. Sandell shot him. My, such a big imagination, Mr. Novak. Why don't you relax? Here. Look, I got proof in my pocket, baby. You want the rest of this couch now? I've been lonesome, Novak. It's going to get worse with your brother gone. Take a look at the paper. Later, Patsy. Yeah, you've been practicing. You're getting weak, Patsy. I can feel your heart pounding. Yeah, now let's quiet down and talk murder, Patsy, shall we? Patsy, you're hurting. You're hurting me. Where's Sandell? Please, Patsy. Where's Sandell? Where is he? It's in my arm. You'll break it. I'll tear it off and throw it away. Now, where's Sandell? I don't know. I swear I don't. He killed your brother. He shot him down on the street. It's a bum joke, Novak. All right, if you won't believe me, take a look at this chronicle. Right there on the front page. You're lying, Novak. Look at it. No. Sandell promised. Promised he wouldn't touch Mike. Why complain? Think how Mike feels. Now, where's Sandell? He's down at the hotel. The Durban Arms on Eddy Street. He lied to me, Novak. I played it straight, but he lied to me. Yeah, you're a mistake, baby. I'll see you later. Don't leave, Novak. The body just died. Dex, why'd you do it? You lied. You and Sandell, you promised me. And you killed him. Timora, sweetheart, somebody had to go. Like that altar boy, huh? Got it once, Novak. It's tougher the second time. There's no second time, Dex. (laughs) All right, sweetheart. Now take him back. (laughs) Yeah, you're finished even, baby. They promised me that, but they lied. He and Sandell, they killed Mike and they lied. Patsy, hold me. Hold me, Patsy. Sorry, baby, you make this trip alone. There wasn't anything I could do for them, so I took a cab down to the Durban Arms on Eddy Street, but Sandell had checked out an hour before. The clerk told me his baggage was still around, though. So I figured that could only mean one thing. I put in a call for Hellman, and then I grabbed a cab and headed for Father Leahy's. By the time I got up on the hill, the fog had taken a lease on most of the town. You can always tell when it's thick, because all the sounds out in the bay get a free ride. Halfway there, the driver was ready to quit, but for an extra two bucks, he threw the cab in second, and we crawled the rest of the way till we got a block from the church. By that time, the fog was so thick, you could have sold it with a pound. I did the last block on foot. I was just about... 20 yards away when I spotted Sandell and Mac the Gunsel standing under a street light just outside the door to the church. They waited a minute, and when they turned and started up the steps. Don't bother, Sandell. You call too late. Huh? Who is it? Who's out there? It's a spark plug, Lord Novak. Novak. Come closer. I can't see you in the park. Come on out and get me, Sandell. There he is, Mac. You're flying blind, Sandell. You made the trip for nothing. I got the gun and I got the papers. He's lying, lad. Come on out, Novak. We'll make a deal. I said you're late, Sandell. 
I already made the deal with Mac. You're funny, Novak. This'll shut you up. Not even close, Mac. Which one have you got the order, boy? You sound worried, Novak. You want to tell him a lot or should I? Mac deals a lot better than you shoot, Sandell. Ask him about it. Huh? What's he saying, Mac? He's saying nothing, lot. He's talking crazy. Let's go out and get him. Ask Mac about this afternoon, Sandell. Ask him where he was when Dex got it. Ask him how I got the gun in the paper. He's crazy, lad. I'm not so sure, Mac. Don't be a sucker, lad. Novak's playing cute. Sorry, Mac. You took the chance. He's cunning, you lad. He's lying. Could be, Mac, but I can't chance it. I'm not, you fool! All right, Sandell. Now it's just you and me in the fog. Come on in, Novak. We'll work a deal. Come in where I can see you. All right. That's five shots, Lud. You got one left to make good on. All right, Sandell, now we're even. Come here. Let me go, Novak. Yeah. Lay off, Novak. What did I do to you? Cut it out, will you? You didn't get hurt. Talk to that alder boy, huh? I didn't mean to hit the kid. Oh, I'm sick of your mouth. All right, Novak, that's enough. Novak, I said that's enough. Yeah. Let go of him. This Sandell? Yeah, that's him. A few minutes ago, we could have booked him for murder. You can have him now, Hellman. Yeah. You saved the state some money, Novak. Next broken. That you, Patsy? Over here, Father. On the steps. Hello, Inspector. Father? This the man, Patsy? Yeah, Father, that's him. I'll pray for him, Patsy. Why waste it, Father? He wasn't worth it. They said the same thing about two men on a hill in Calvary. clearer for everybody. The story was the cheap earth of kind, but then so were the characters. After Mike Quinlan joined up with Sandell and his boys back in 1940, they pulled a bank job in Chicago, and instead of cutting in Mike on the take, Sandell framed him to take the rap for the three of them. Then Sandell came west to operate and lined up Quinlan's sister for his girlfriend. By the time Quinlan was paroled, he was fast on Sandell's game, and he had lots to beef about he lined up enough good evidence to put Sandell and his two boys away for life, and then he threatened to spill it if Sandell didn't cut him in for his share of the job and stay white of his sister. Sandell wasn't generous, and he wasn't genteel, so he played along with his tongue in his cheek and a gun in his pocket. When the time came to swap money for evidence, Quinlan picked the church for a trading ground because that's where he'd hidden the box with the evidence. That's where we finally found it. The deal was all set to go, and something scared Quinlan off, and Sandell came in, mistook me for Quinlan, who hit little Jake. Sandell's boys tried to get at Quinlan through his girl, Sally Kimbrough, and when she wouldn't spill, they killed her and planted the body in my apartment to take care of the opposition. Mac and Sandell were in the black sedan when it finally caught up with Quinlan in the alley off Mission Street. Well, what did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy took Jocko to dinner at Lupo's a couple of days later. Jocko's bar bill read like a social security number. Hellman asked only one question. How could Father Leahy ever pay for a dinner check that big? I don't know, but when he got back to his church, I noticed he slipped an IOU in the poor box.
previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Thank <laughs> you.